So welcome everyone. My name is Alejandro Velasco. I'm uh, the executive editor of NACLA Report on the Americas. I'm also a um, historian at NYU. And it's a great pleasure to be able to um, welcome all of you to our first webinar um, and certainly to um, hope that everyone who is joining us is as healthy and as safe as possible. These are very uncertain times. Um, uh, the strange um, upside of this um, Zoom context in which we now find ourselves is that it allows us to hold events like this um, in a format that uh, is perhaps a little bit more available than if we were to host it in New York City, which is where we where NACLA is based. Um, of course, we're using a lot in terms of the opportunity to be able to connect um, in a more uh, direct way. But one of the um, you know, one of the challenges, at least for myself in this moment, is to try to feel some sort of sense of connection um, in a context where that connection itself is now very frayed. And so one of the reasons why we imagined um, this particular event, um, which we had initially thought to perhaps do in, in person before, of course, everything, um, you know, social distancing uh, became the rule of the day, was in order to be able to foster a space and to create a, a, a platform where we could connect and continue to discuss and debate the pressing issues, not only of the present moment, but also of the moment that will follow this moment. Um, uh, thinking about and imagining futures is I think right now more important than ever, even though the uh, genesis of this particular issue, which is what we are introducing today or virtually launching today, um, was certainly uh, begun to be thought about at a time when um, coronavirus was not anywhere in our radar screens. Uh, in fact, we began to talk about this um, late last uh, uh, late last year, um, and it began basically at a moment when our discussions around it began at a moment when um, we were in the midst of uh, the Bernie Sanders campaign ascendancy in the US presidential election. And it, uh, even though of course that campaign has now been suspended, the, and with certainly tremendous amounts of, of regret as to what that has left in terms of um, Joe Biden as the standard bearer for the Democratic Party, the energy around the moment of possibility and the opportunities to think about what a more progressive um, administration at the helm of the U.S. government might look like in a variety of realms was, was very much vibrant and, and really was the um, the driving force behind our um, our idea to try to focus on what progressive uh, policies might look like um, in the United States. And so we imagined a double issue and the first of the issues was gonna deal with US policy in the hemisphere. Um, and the second one, which will be coming up um, soon, our, um, our summer issue, will deal with environmental policies, and in particular, the Green New Deal, um, and how the Green New Deal does or doesn't translate um, uh, literally and figuratively uh, and politically, of course, um, in, in the hemisphere. Um, but this one in particular, of course, is right at the heart of what NACLA is. NACLA was founded in 1966 and 1967 in the wake of the U.S. invasion of the Dominican Republic, and for decades, really, was the sole voice um, reporting on uh, not only against uh, U.S. imperial interventions in the region, but also in favor of progressive social movements in the region. Um, and so this, to some extent, is, you know, this to a large extent, actually, is, is what NACLA has always been doing. It's always been both um, uh, and calling out um, U.S. imperial interventions in the region, but also at the same time um, imagining alternative futures. Um, and of course, we were doing that at a moment uh, where we're doing this particular issue at a moment um, when, as I mentioned before, there seemed to be a slight opening with um, the Sanders campaign. 
And even though the Sanders campaign has not been suspended, I think in, in oddly the the moment of coronavirus has um, thrown some. Um, has reopened the opportunity to think about what a uh, future after COVID is going to look like in all matter of realms. Um, and uh, questions around U.S. policy in the region are, are certainly front and center of that. So that is what um, we had in mind um, when we began to put together um, this issue. And we're extremely fortunate to have Vanessa Frazee um, and Danny Besner at the University of Washington, um, uh, scholars who um, work on, um, on Mexico and, and hemispheric relations more generally uh, to agree to guest edit the issue. Um, and they were able to put together with the assistance of our amazing um, managing editor, Heather Fries, um, a tremendous uh, panel of contributors who uh, looked at various countries in the region, but also various elements of US policy in the region and what a progressive um, approach might look like. So today we'll be able to hear not only from Vanessa and several of the contributors to the issue, um, but also from Linda Farthing, who is a longtime activista, who even though she's not part of the, um, the issue, she has been writing about, uh, not just right now, but has long been writing about Bolivia um, uh, for NACLA and many other outlets. And so she will give us an update of what's going on in Bolivia um, as part of this larger conversation. Excuse me. Um, I should mention that if you don't know already, the issue is available online. Um, and that is through the NACLA.org website. You can find a link to it there. Um, several of the articles um, in the collection are available open access, including the um, introduction that's written by Vanessa and by Danny. Um, and uh, in addition, you uh, are, we are, the uh, issue is available in print um, and it features a spectacular cover. If you've not seen it already, I would encourage you again to just look up the NACLA.org website, um, which really captures uh, a sense of possibility, um, but that a possibility that has to come about as a result of, of, of struggle, which is basically what this story has long been for, um, for the Americas and imagining different alternatives to um, uh, whether it's US or neoliberal hegemony in the region. Um, and those, uh, those print issues are available for sale um, for $15 a piece, and you can um, purchase them by making a donation to nakla.org backlash donate, and then just write in the note uh, box in the, when you're making your donation that you would like an issue to be mailed to you. Um, we unfortunately are not able to mail those right now, and we're not quite sure when we will be able to mail those because uh, we, as many people, have been shut out of our office, uh, which is located on the campus of NYU. But um, as soon as we're able to get back into the office, we will be happy to, to mail those issues to you. So if you are interested in acquiring the full issue, including, again, this amazing um, cover, uh, please make a donation of $15 to nakla.org backslash donate. Um, as I mentioned, our next issue is also extremely exciting on the Green New Deal, and that will be guest edited by um, Daniel Cohen and Theodore Francos, who have been at the forefront of um, uh, of really pushing for Green New Deal in the United States, but also imagining environmental um, uh, mobilizations in a more progressive vein in the Americas. And so we're quite um, excited for that. And in the fall, our fall issue will be um, looking at the uh, state of public health in the region, especially in light of, of COVID. Um, so very much um, uh, a, a, a commitment, it sort of showcases uh, NACLA's continuing commitment and strength to providing in-depth analysis that it that is both timely, um, uh, but also is um, uh, is uh, is armed with a deep sense of where the region's history, um, especially in terms of progressive politics, um, uh, comes. So, uh, if you are so inclined, please subscribe.
um, to the NACO report so you can receive uh, four uh, yearly uh, issues, which we continue to put out. Um, if you are have not already, please also subscribe to our newsletter, which comes out um, every week or every other week. And it uh, provides you with um, our most recent coverage, especially our web coverage, um, which is separate from the online um, uh, from the print coverage um, that we provide with our magazine and that you can use by again clicking on our website knockland.org and you can subscribe to our newsletter and that is for your charge um, and finally you know this uh, uh, this enterprise even though it has been going on for now over 50 years um, and it has seen times of plenty and times of scarcity, um, including as some who may be on the call uh, and maybe longtime Naclistas remember the shutting down of the magazine about five years ago. Um, and we were able to, to relaunch the magazine um, uh, with tremendous amount of effort and energy. Uh, this is a, an enterprise that is very much a shoestring enterprise and long has been. Um, and so especially now, if you are at all able we uh, hope that you will donate uh, to NACLA to allow us to continue our work. Um, and so again, to do that, please um, log on to nakla.org backslash donate. Okay, um, with those preliminaries out of the way, I just want to give a brief intro, uh, in, uh, intro to the people who will be participating and then cede it to Vanessa, first Linda, um, who will talk about Bolivia and then to Vanessa who will, um, uh, 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 coordinate discussion around the issue. Um, so first we're going to hear a short update on the situation in Bolivia where um, as many of you may be aware coronavirus has postponed um, the or the the uh, government um, of uh, the uh, you know, self-declared um, interim president um, Shani Najas um, who um, you know came to power after the um, the ouster, the coup of uh, against Evo Morales. Um, those are, are elections were scheduled for May, but now they have been indefinitely postponed. So we'll hear an update from from Linda Farthing on that. And then we're going to have a roundtable discussion on proposals for rethinking foreign policy. Um, that's led by Vanessa Frege, again, one of our guest editors. Vanessa is an assistant professor of international studies at the University of Washington. And she'll be in conversation with Alex Main, who is the director of international policy at the Center for Economic and Policy Research in Washington, DC. Um, and he wrote in our latest issue about sanctions and economic statecraft. Alex is also open to taking questions about um, the CEPR report on Bolivia's elections, as well as the, uh, the role of the Organization of American States um, in Bolivia during the Q&A. Um, she'll also be joined by Andre Plagarini, who is a lecturer in Latin American, Latino and Caribbean studies at Dartmouth College. And previously he was visiting assistant professor of modern Latin American history at Brown University. And his contribution to the issue is on Brazil US relations, um, which of course are extremely now more timely than ever given the, um, you know, the crisis that is afflicting both of those nations in light of both of these nations in light of COVID. Um, and then uh, finally, we'll have uh, Zara Kasame, who is a doctoral candidate in uh, Latin American history at NYU. She co-authored a piece in our issue on Cuban sovereignty and on U.S.-Cuba relations. And so we'll look forward to, to that. But first, again, discussing Bolivia, we're going to hear from Linda Farthing. Linda is a journalist and researcher based in Bolivia and a regular NACLA contributor. She wrote a piece um, on the coup in Bolivia and it's the repression since that was not part of the um, report, but part of the around the region. And again, a reminder that we will be taking all questions after the round table, which will uh, go till about 7 p.m. And then at that point, we'll just open it up for questions, which we will ask you to do by using the Q&A feature of, of the webinar. Um, uh, and you can submit those questions to us um, at any time. Okay, so uh, Linda, I will hand it over to you. Thanks, Alejandro.
And hello and welcome to everybody. So I'm going to give a brief update on um, what has actually mostly what has happened in Bolivia since the coup and with the coronavirus. So Bolivia was one of the first countries in Latin America to declare a quarantine on March 21st. And it was one of only four countries in Latin America to declare a total shutdown. Such a lockdown is the only hope that the country has to contain the virus. The healthcare system is just not equipped to deal with the flood of desperately ill people, even though its capacity was more than doubled during the uh, previous government of Evo Morales. Countrywide, Bolivia only has one third of the intensive care beds estimated to be necessary. But in poor areas such as the city of El Alto, only eight beds or uh, intensive care beds are available for a population of about a million people. Bolivia has currently around a thousand cases, half of these in eastern Santa Cruz. Just like everywhere else in the world, uh, the quarantine has fallen hardest on the poorest and most vulnerable. 70% of Bolivians work in the formal economy. This is actually the highest rate in the world. And many live hand to mouth. Potable water, which is needed for hand washing, is inaccessible to about a quarter of the population. While some middle class Bolivians are organizing food drives, this is a drop in the bucket in one of South America's poorest countries. The interim government's quick action on the coronavirus has won a praise from uh, many in the international community, most recently from Forbes magazine. But what these arguably uh, laudable actions in terms of moving quickly mask is the month-long lag in providing emergency funds to marginalized populations. Many people have still not received any assistance. The government um, the government, which has repeatedly violated its mandate to serve as an interim administration until new elections are held, has been using draconian uh, coronavirus measures against its political enemies. Those who break quarantine rules are called in the, in, by the government in the press terrorists and subversives. The elections scheduled for May 3rd to find a successor to Evo Morales have been postponed by the Electoral Tribunal, which has been proposed that they be held between uh, in the, the first weeks of June and September. But the longer the government under the Christian evangelical Janine Añez remains in power, the more it can persecute past and current members of Morales' party, the MAS, and dismantle its programs, such as requiring, for example, that tin be smelted locally before it's exported, which is a major issue in a country uh, with such low levels of industrialization as, as Bolivia. <clears throat> One of its quarantine degrees is so vague that it immediately raised international concerns that it violates freedom of expression. Just last week, the government's interior minister, Arturo Murillo, accused the MAS presidential candidate, Luis Arce Catacora, of replacing Evo Morales as, the, as, quote, the godfather of drug traffickers. In the same week, the government arrested Patricia Arce, the MAS mayor of a small town outside Cochabamba, for supposedly breaking the quarantine. She had early been violently attacked and humiliated by right-wing vigilantes after the November coup. If convicted, she could receive between three and 10 years imprisonment and would be unable to run for Senate in the next elections. Other mass activists have been arrested as well, and we're talking about since the decrease um, under the coronavirus, including those distributing food to hungry people and those who have formed uh, pro mass WhatsApp groups. In response to the constant harassment and repression, the MAS party is pushing for elections to take place at the end of July. The MAS remains the most popular political force in the country. In a mid-March poll, which was the last one to be conducted, Luis Arce led by just over 33% of the vote, followed by the centrist uh, former president, Carlos Mesa, with 18% and Añez at 16.5%. The distrust of the Añez government is um, very widespread, uh, and it runs particularly high in the two areas that suffered massacres, massacres during the, the pacification process after the um, November 2019 coup. In the Chapari region, which is east of Cochabamba, and which is uh, one of the major coca grower regions in the country, 
and one of Evo Morales' political strongholds. The sudden arrival of 84 police personnel last week, five months after they had been forced out of the region, led to a spontaneous protest demanding that they should be quarantined. Banks refused to operate in the Chapari without a police presence, which prevented residences from receiving one of the three emergency subsidies and loans the government has provided because of the coronavirus. For the past two weeks, the government has prohibited gasoline sales in the region, which threatens to completely destroy fish farming, which has developed as a viable economic alternative to coca leaf. On April 22nd, an agreement was assigned allowing the police back under the conditions that the banks be reopened and the gasoline be made available. To date, that hasn't happened. Instead, Interior Minister Murillo announced that, quote, the majority of Chapari residents are prisoners of the Kokogoro union leaders and drug traffickers, and reiterated threats that leaders will be arrested for drug dealing. The second massacre occurred on November 19th in Sencata, an El Alto neighborhood where La Paz's gas distribution plant is located. Sencata pay, played a major role and suffered numerous deaths during the 2003 uprising known as the Gas War. Along with two other of the poorest neighborhoods in El Alto, the quarantine has not been widely respected, partly because people are so poor and have to work, but also because residents fear it represents a power grab on the part of the Añez government. But the poorest are increasingly desperate and small protests have, against the quarantine have erupted in low income neighborhoods across the country. The Agnes government insists they are instigated by the MAS and an allegation that the MAS vigorously denies. Just like everywhere else in the region, violence against women has also spiked. The country already had the region's second highest rate of femicide and lockdown has only exacerbated the situation. Bolivia's economy, which boasted one of the highest rates of growth in, region, in Latin America in recent years, was on the verge of faltering before the coronavirus hit. Gas sales had fallen, and under Morales, financial reserves were half to maintain government spending levels, leading public debt to spike. Now, with the plunge in oil prices, which directly affects the price of natural gas, government revenues will be severely curtailed as commodities have always provided the base of Bolivia's export economy. Remittances from abroad have also plummeted, and these mostly come from Argentina, um, Spain, and to some degree from Brazil. Um, in 2019, the GDP of the three departments most of the country, most dependent on extractivist industries, fell into negative territory. Last week, the UN's Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean revised its performance predictions for the Bolivian economy from 3% growth to a contraction of 3%. The double whammy of the coup followed by the coronavirus signals a serious reversal in Bolivia's fortunes. The combination of repression and a collapsing economy is almost certain to significantly undermine the gains made by Bolivia's poor and indigenous majority during the Morales government. And it's unclear that even if the, if the MAS were to win the elections and were permitted or allowed or able to take power, that they would be able to um, correct this any time in the near future. Thank you so much, Linda. You're welcome. Okay, we'll um, pass that on. Again, if you have any questions for, for Linda, feel free to uh, write them in the Q&A section and we'll address them at the end of the, the round table. Um, and we'll pass it off now to Vanessa. Thank you, Alejandro. Um, before turning things over to the speakers, I wanted to just give a quick thanks to the NACLA team for organizing this round table. Um, I usually look uh, at the announcements with jealousy from the West Coast because I can never attend them. So it's nice to actually be able to attend this one virtually. And thanks for providing us with this opportunity to um, publicize the, the issue, which I'm really happy with. Um, and thanks so much to the contributors for the amazing pieces you all contributed. So before um, asking you all a few questions and hopefully generating some conversation, I wanted to just give um, Alex, Andre, and Sarah an opportunity to tell listeners or participants who might not have had a chance to read the issue yet a quick synopsis of your piece. 
Um, so we'll start with Alex and move uh, alphabetically. Okay, is that my cue? All right, great. Um, Over to you, Alex. Okay, well, um, first of all, uh, thank you, Vanessa, and thanks to uh, Dan Bessner and also Heather for all your hard work on this issue. Um, you know, based on my experience with uh, the three of you, uh, you did put a lot of work into this um, and a lot of thought as well, and, and your feedback on my piece was extremely useful, so I, I appreciate that. And of course, thanks to Heather and, and Alejandro for organizing this uh, webinar. And it's great to see that there are so many people uh, that are participating. Hopefully we'll have a good Q&A. So I'll try to be uh, quick here. Um, I, I'm just gonna talk about the main points in my article. And, and then if there's time, maybe provide a quick uh, sort of COVID-19 update since the article was written in a very different context, I think at the end of December, early January. Uh, a lot of things have changed since. Uh, but my piece was focused, as Alejandro mentioned, on uh, US uh, economic statecraft in Latin America. And so this term economic statecraft, what I tried to do is stretch the term a little bit out beyond its common usage. Uh, because typically, at least here in Washington, when you hear that term, it refers to a sort of economic course of measure in particular sanctions, uh, embargoes, boycotts, and so on, the sort of crude and blatant uh, measures uh, that seek to impose a political agenda, um, often uh, regime change. And so I, I look at that, I look at sanctions, um, but I also wanted to look at other things. So I extended the analysis a bit to other less overt methods and tools of uh, you know, the US government to impose its agenda in the re region, in this case, uh, a neoliberal agenda. Um, and these forms of intervention, along with sanctions, are you know, through international financial institutions like the IMF and World Bank, US trade policy, and uh, US assistance programs in the region. So that's a lot to cover in an article. And so it's really a very brief summary in each area, and I think you know, each is kind of worth a chapter of a book, but I don't have time to write that book. Um, but the, the point really was to uh, sort of bring into clearer focus the forms of economic inter intervention of the U.S. Uh, as, you know, critiques of U.S. foreign policy are often focused more on political and military intervention, but I think, and, and this is a lot of my organization, the Center for Economic and Policy Research's work, we, we look at, you know, how the U.S. intervenes economically um, and I would argue that over the last few decades, um, you know, that form of intervention has often had more enduring sort of results um, in a lot of countries uh, than the sort of more overt uh, political, political and military intervention. Um, of course, all of these things go hand in hand, but, you know, I, I sort of narrowed the spectrum to, to economic uh, areas of intervention. So um, I started the article with sanctions. You know, the, the liberal foreign policy establishment here in Washington tends to support them and tends to turn a blind eye to the suffering that sanctions uh, provoke, uh, huge human suffering within populations. Um, and CEPR, um, my organization has of course looked at the case of Venezuela in particular. Uh, you know, the dominant narrative there, you know, Maduro just blames the US for all the country's problems and so on and you, you really get that from most of the media, the think tanks, and they never actually look at the impact of economic sanctions. And so that's one thing we did. Um, you know, and it's, it's, it's an odd thing, really. It just shows how warped things are, at least here in Washington. Um, because the, the US government itself makes it very clear that its intention with sanctions is to bring about political change. And how does it do that? Um, you know, it, it basically, you know, tries to get the uh, population to react, and it does that by, by causing human suffering. So in Venezuela, you know, we calculated that at the time of our report, which was a while ago, which was in early 2019, um, the sanctions had killed, you know, around 40,000 people at least. Um, and I expect it's been much, much more since then, particularly as there have been more harsh sanctions on the oil sector since then. Um, and so, 
you know, this article, I looked at just a few sanctions, Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua, looked at the effects of these sanctions and, you know, just question whether they're respectful of human rights. I think I showed that they weren't. And, and then whether they're effective in actually bringing about um, the change that they're officially there for. Um, and, and there they don't function either. So it's really just punishment of populations with, with no results, whether or not you agree with uh, the results that are intended by the sanctions. Uh, then I looked in the article at the uh, US role in, in imposing neoliberalism through the IMF. And, and there I drew on some recent work by Alexander uh, Kentik Hellenis and Sarah Bob, um, where they did a, some really good research that I think you know, provides confirmation that the US government not only supported um, the neoliberal po policies of the IMF, and of course, uh, it was in the late 70s, early 80s that the IMF began to really impose um, uh, these neoliberal conditionalities on its loans uh, to countries. Um, it, so the, the work that these two scholars did uh, really shows uh, that the U.S. played a major role in getting the IMF to adopt, uh, you know, these policies. And I look at how IMF policies have totally failed to promote economic growth and better living conditions in Latin America. Here, again, drawing on the work uh, that we've been doing at CEPA for years. Um, and instead have led to a greater financialization of the economies and, and have really benefited domestic and transnational financial capital um, at the expense of, you know, the interests of the majority of the peoples of those countries. And um, the most recent examples of IMF programs are in Ecuador and Argentina, and you can see that they're really continuing uh, to impose these same neoliberal uh, conditions, uh, despite a change in rhetoric. I also looked at the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank, where of course the US again has an enormous influence uh, and where they played a big role in promoting and assisting um, uh, the implementation of neoliberal policy reforms in, in countries. So the more structural sort of reforms, deregulation, privatization, and so on, um, all in favor of attracting more foreign direct investment. And the end result of that has been really a race to the bottom in these countries. Um, and, and really, you know, focus uh, rather than on a, a focus on, on greater industrialization and so on, more of a focus on um, really commodities and, um, you, know, uh, you know, various industries that have very little value added to them. And, um, you know, the result of these structural reforms is to create uh, very open financial markets in these countries that are constantly threat threatened by capital flight and potential financial collapse. Um, you know, this is very apparent in countries like Mexico today. Um, I, I then looked at the U.S. foreign assistance system, uh, US, USAID in particular. Um, so, you know, this USAID often has sort of this you know, positive image that it's helpful to economic development in the very worst case, you know, sort of benign. Um, in fact, you know, and what I tried to show um, fairly quickly in this article is that uh, it's often contributed to undermining sort of state systems and particularly institutions that provide basic social services like healthcare and education. Um, the funding advice that's provided by USAID uh, frequently goes to, um, you know, unaccountable NGOs um, and, and, again, undermines, uh, you know, these um, public services. And, and we see this uh, particularly, uh, we see the influence of USAID um, in this process in the poorer countries of the Caribbean and Central America. Countries like Haiti and Honduras really stand out. Um, and then finally, I looked at um, U.S. trade policy and, and how it's really served to strengthen foreign investor protections. Uh, so again, sort of contributing to the sort of financialization of economies um, and you know, the deregulation of financial markets. And, and again, the data shows that you know, despite um, all the promises that have been made when these trade agreements have been signed, uh, they generally do not lead to economic progress uh, for, for the countries. Um, in some cases, like Mexico under NAFTA, 
uh, countries are less better off today. And we did a paper on this just a few years ago uh, showing that, you know, after uh, 20 years, I think we did the 23 years of, of NAFTA because there was the debate, of course, on, on the renegotiation of NAFTA and, and showed that Mexico is less better off. There are higher levels of poverty and, and growth has been uh, extremely stagnant in the country since uh, NAFTA was signed. Uh, and then I end the piece on, you know, hopefully a constructive note where I look at uh, a series of measures that I think progressives can support to help remodel U.S. economic statecraft so that it's not as harmful to the people of Latin America. And in terms of sanctions, uh, you know, one way to do this is to oppose executive sanctions powers. So, you know, under current U.S. law, the U.S. president has unilateral power without approval of the Congress to impose sanctions left and right. And this is why Trump has been able to do this so easily in Venezuela and other countries. Um, there's no real um, oversight or control coming from Congress. Uh, and, and just worth mentioning here that we've been working with some members of Congress, in particular, Ilmar, on some legislation that seeks to change this, to reform this system so that Congress has its say um, in terms of uh, sanctions that are imposed by the executive branch. Uh, so that's recent legislation that came out and that people you know, can support. Um, and then, uh, so I, I also recommended more dem democratization of the executive boards of international financial institutions. This has, of course, uh, been a big cause for, for many organizations, you know, uh, focused on um, helping sort of the global south. Um, also supporting sovereign debt workout mechanisms, UNCTAD. Um, has done some really good work on this. And uh, there's also, I think, some interest in the US Congress in supporting this. Uh, and then uh, finally, um, reforming US aid so that the programs don't undermine institu inst any institutions that provide public services. Um, so this is a very ambitious sort of program, uh, obviously. But you know, again, as Alejandro mentioned, um, we did write this kind of an, in an idealistic moment when we thought that um, the election of Bernie Sanders might be possible. Uh, but I, I think it is, as Alejandro also underlined, still uh, valid. There is a strong progressive movement um, that's uh, going to continue to have a huge influence within the Democratic Party, and we need to keep that in mind. And so we can continue to sort of um, support these sorts of reforms. Um, and then do I have time for the very quick COVID update or am I out of time? I'm, I'm happy to stop and do the COVID update afterwards or, you know. Yeah, can we, I think we can uh, move on um, and then okay. we'll do the COVID on the Q&A, is that all right? That's fine. Great, thank you so much, Alex. Sure. Great, thank you, Alex. Um, Andre, we'd love to hear from you now about your piece about US-Brazilian relations. Great. So like Alex, um, I want to begin by thanking um, everyone involved for the invitation. I was, in fact, really, really happy to be asked to contribute to this piece because it's been sort of an obsession for me uh, since Bolsonaro was elected, basically. Every back and forth between the Brazilian government and, and the U.S. government, um, like I said, I've been really sort of obsessed with tracking this. So the invitation um, from Vanessa and, and Daniel and, and Alejandro and Heather was really you know, I, I was really, really happy by the, by the invitation. Um, and I thought um, I would begin just by sort of prefacing one thing I've been saying to my students, I'm teaching History of Brazil this term um, online. And I've been, every time Bolsonaro comes up, I have a current events component. And every time Bolsonaro comes up, I say, I want to be fair, right, but transparent, which is that I, you know, I, I think he's an unmitigated disaster in a whole host of ways that, that I'll get into. But I also think sort of, you know, saying that and acknowledging that is, is not really helpful unless we can try to understand the appeal that someone like him has. Um, and that, I think, understanding that appeal is key also um, if we want to think about uh, how a progressive uh, democratic president or how a progressive movement in the United States would uh, approach Brazil, would approach a Brazil that elected Bolsonaro in the first place. Um, so again, to kind of be transparent about my, my, my thoughts about the guy, but also uh, to be fair in, in, in sort of understanding the worldview that led him to, uh, to, to his power today, to where he is today. Um, so I begin the piece by talking about 
the very recent past, um, the PT year specifically, and, and, and what that foreign policy looked like, what relations between um, the center left governments of the Workers' Party were like with Washington. And I begin with an anecdote that I really, really like. Um, uh, it, w- it was, uh, you know, one of these things when I first started thinking about the piece, one of the first things that came to mind was this sort of anecdote, because I think it says a lot about this different moment that we were in um, about, you know, 15 years ago or so and where we are now. And it's the, uh, you know, it's 2003, it's the G8 uh, summit meeting. It's Lula has just recently been inaugurated and they're at this very swanky dinner. All the heads of state are at their tables and Lula walks in with the Brazilian delegation and everyone kind of, you know, nods politely and kind of waves and hello, hello. They take their seats. And then George Bush and the you know, United States delegation comes in. Everybody stands up. There's this kind of rapturous attention, obviously, right? This is the U.S. president. Everyone wants a few minutes with him. And Lula, he tells this story very frequently. He told everyone at the Brazilian table, nobody stand up. Everybody stay seated. Um, because he immediately kind of sensed, right, that that's where the power is. That the people that everyone at the table is standing for, um, that's, that, you know, that's kind of all you need to understand about the power dynamics in that room. Uh, he said, no one stood up for us when we, came, when we came in here, so why should we stand? And eventually, you know, Bush uh, makes his way through all the tables and he comes and he, and he introduces himself and, 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 and sits down for a few minutes with Lula. And Lula brought this up over the years several times, I think to illustrate a point that, you know, nobody respects a bootlicker, right? And he, that's the kind of the language he uses. Nobody is going to respect Brazil if we're one of these countries you know, that's kind of jumping uh, and happy just for a pat on the head and just for some attention from, from the United States government. And I think that gets to uh, one of two competing views of Brazil's role in the hemisphere, uh, Brazil's relations with the United States. Um, and the first one, and so I talk about these uh, in the piece a little bit, is the idea that I think essentially guided um, the PT's foreign policy um, over its more than a decade in power, it's not one that it invented. Uh, it has, you know, deep traditions um, going back to the 1960s and before in Brazil. But it's basically that, like, look, you know, Brazil is a country that is very, very large. It has a young, dynamic population. Um, it should have some sort of um, influence or some ability to shape outcomes um, in the Western Hemisphere without always having to defer to the United States, without having to ask permission. Um, so one of the most, I think, emblematic examples of this um, under the PT was when Lula took the initiative of negotiating uh, a deal that in many ways was similar to the Iran deal that the Obama administration would later negotiate with Iran, right? And Lula's logic again was that you know, Brazil is distinct um, among the countries of Latin America, that it has the ability to project um, influence um, and it can and should wield that influence. Now, that position was criticized even within Latin America, um, even at the height of the pink tide, right? At the height of these so-called, uh, the, these, these leftist governments in power as a kind of sub-imperialism, that Brazil was a little uh, too eager to throw its weight around. There are stories of behind the scenes of Evo Morales really giving Lula an earful about, uh, uh, you know, Brazil, Brazil, Brazil's strong army in uh, um, Bolivia in, in, in several ways. But that is, I think, a consistent uh, uh, view about how Brazil should develop, how it should assert itself in the hemisphere, right? That it, 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 it shouldn't need permission from Washington to do the things that it thinks are in its interest. I think the right wing, the conservative critique of that is that it's fundamentally delusional. That Brazil, for all its size, for all its influence, is still a poor country. It still needs foreign capital if it wants to continue to develop and it wants to accelerate development. Uh, That it shouldn't sort of uh, get ahead of itself in terms of how it sees itself on the world stage. And, And it shouldn't project more than it can deliver. And so I think one of the things we've seen with the Bolsonaro administration is a real departure from that kind of assertiveness and that kind of self-confidence to one of, uh, you know, rec- they would say, right, recognizing 
Brazil's limitations, that rather than opening um, embassies all over Africa, as the PT did, all over the Caribbean, as the PT did, uh, PT did that the Brazilian government should recognize its limitations and sort of pick its battles strategically um, in the hopes of eventually these things adding up to greater material uh, gain, gain for, for the Brazilian people. So very distinct visions, I think, uh, in, in terms of foreign policy. So that's where I began um, in thinking about how I'd write the article because, okay, so we have these two different approaches in the Brazilian government. How then should the United States respond? I mean, the Bolsonaro administration is in power now, right? It won't be forever. It might not even be for the, for the full term, um, as, as we'll kind of, maybe we'll get to in the Q&A. Um, so, and, and, and so, so, so uh, what do we do with that? And so I came up with, you know, I kind of slightly arbitrarily came up with four, I think, pillars of what I think uh, should guide the way um, progressive thinkers, progressive activists, and ultimately progressive policymakers should have in mind when thinking about how to approach uh, this administration. And it bears mentioning before I go into these that the Bolsonaro government uh, in some ways is anomalous. That is, it's, he, uh, Bolsonaro himself is one of the very first right-wing figures in Latin America to win an election explicitly in defense of military rule, right? explicitly in defense of the, the, the dictatorship for, that lasted from 1964 to 1985. So, you know, that's not, he's not a normal sort of uh, uh, right, right-wing figure in that sense. On the other hand, though, I think he does, the government he's put together draws from very traditional conservative uh, uh, ideas in Latin America, right? His uh, um, finance minister is literally a Chicago boy. Um, his uh, minister of, of the environment is someone who is very much linked to big agriculture. So he kind of straddles this line. And the other thing that sets him apart from other uh, predecessors is the extent to which he is betting his political future, Bolsonaro is, on Trump's reelection. Right? His sons have posed with, you know, MAGA hats. Um, and he so recognizes the importance of continue Donald, you know, Donald Trump continuing to stay in power and recognizing also how devastating a Democrat would, would be to, to, to his idea of, of Brazil's place in the world. Um, so the four ideas that I, that I thought about, the first is, generally speaking, a sense of humility, both about the United States' role in the Western Hemisphere, as well as a sense of humility in recognizing Brazil's sense of itself in the hemisphere. Um, again, this is not new, uh, this idea that Brazil sees itself as a nation apart in Latin America because of its size and influence, and also the United States recognizing that as well, right? During the Cold War, of course, American policymakers said it was one thing to lose Cuba, it would be an entirely another thing to lose Brazil. So I think, you know, uh, American policymakers, would it, would it would go a long way towards uh, you know, improving relations between both countries, to recognize that, to not interpret um, every gesture that a left-wing government in Brazil makes um, as an affront or as a threat. And I, you know, and I know that's sort of, you know, abstract and it's uh, kind of a feel-good kind of idea, but I think it's really, really important to Brazilians to hear that message coming from figures like, at the time I was writing, Bernie Sanders, um, a sense of solidarity, right? So that's the, that's the, the, the first kind of uh, pillar I had in mind. The second, and it's sort of related, is that a new democratic president should double down, should defend vocally the idea of politi political pluralism um, as a sort of inherent value of, of democracy. And here I'm thinking explicitly in response to the frankly dangerous rhetoric of Bolsonaro, both, both during the campaign and since he uh, became president. Uh, and so for the piece, I thought I, specifically for this point, I, I spoke with John Willis, who was the, um, he was a former member of Congress in Brazil, uh, one of the first openly gay members of Congress, who even before the election had a history of direct confrontation with Bolsonaro. Famously, John Willis spat in, in Bolsonaro's face on the floor of Congress. Um, and, you know, 
when Bolsonaro wins the election, the death threats, the, the sense of insecurity that, that Jean Willis had long felt was heightened tremendously, right? He, there were threats against him and his family. Um, and so eventually he uh, left the country and he's now sort of uh, living in exile. Uh, and so I, I, I asked him a little bit in preparation for, to write the piece, what would you say, right, to Senator Warren or Senator Sanders or the kind of the more progressive wing of the Democratic Party, uh, generally speaking, about Latin America, about, I'm sorry, about, about Brazil specifically. And one of the things he said was to recognize both the limitations of the United States materially, but the power of the United States speaking in favor of uh, respect for minority rights, uh, of pluralism, because Bo uh, as I said, Bolsonaro takes many cues um, from the Trump administration uh, to, the, to an extent that is, you know, abnormal in, in Brazilian, in Brazilian uh, politics. But this is not new uh, in terms of the, the, the Brazilian president taking, uh, you know, understanding what's sort of permissible, politically speaking, from an American president. Uh, the example, the, the parallel, of course, is when Jimmy Carter won the election um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the second half of the 1970s, where he comes in firmly placing human rights at the center of uh, American foreign policy, at least discursively. And I, you know, and I always say to my, you know, my to friends in Brazil and others who say, well, you know, yeah, but not much changed. But there was tremendous power, uh, you know, even at a symbolic level, at, of uh, to have the Brazilian, uh, the American president, uh, speak to and address human rights activists in Brazil. We know this from documentation from the from the military regime that this really, really irked them, that it hemmed them in, right? That it limited their ability to justify themselves. And I think the same applies with Bolsonaro. To have um, a movement in, uh, in, in American progressive circles influencing policymakers to explicitly call out that kind of rhetoric, of this kind of aggressive uh, uh, rhetoric, I think it would go a long way and it's, and it's important. So that's number, number two. The third, and you'll, you'll notice, by the way, a lot of these are not just Brazil specific. They apply across you know, an entire progressive foreign policy but I think they have special salience for Brazil. And number three is to place climate change explicitly at the center of uh, the U.S.-Brazil relationship. Um, and I know this, this, you know, this will de be, de be developed further in the next issue of NACLA, as, as Alejandro was, was saying, which will focus on climate change. Uh, but specifically, I'm thinking with regard to the Amazon, right? We, we've seen a tremendous um, uptick in deforestation under Bolsonaro, and the administration denies direct culpability, but, you know, for, for all kinds of reasons, uh, I think it's safe to say the, the administration has created a culture of permissibility uh, around deforestation. And this is a, an, a, an area that's tricky for a Democratic, for a, a U.S. president, because on one hand, you do not want to be seen to tell the Brazilian government how to manage its own resources and how to uh, uh, oversee this part of the country that they see as incredibly important. Both the left and the right historically have seen the Amazon and, 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 and uh, deforestation as a really touchy issue. And I can say more about that in the, Q, in the Q and A. But to speak about climate change as an urgent issue without being seen to lecture or, or to suggest uh, chipping away at Brazil's sovereignty, hugely sensitive issue. Uh, and the last one, and I'll conclude, uh, uh, I know I'm, I'm sort of out of time here, um, is to link the issue of rising inequality in Latin America and in the world with the erosion of democracy, to recognize that these things are linked, right? That the kind of uh, rhetoric and the kind of coalition that Bolsonaro has put together, which is right, violent and it's, it's, it's based on uh, uh, kind of keeping poor the masses sort of in place um, and oftentimes at the barrel of a gun, and this, this is his kind of public uh, safety um, agenda, to recognize that, you know, that this is fundamentally linked to rising inequality in Brazil and abroad, and to kind of make that connection, again, as Warren and Sanders both did in their foreign policy addresses, to recognize that these issues are linked, that it's not acceptable for a country to deliver economic growth at the exclusion of uh, social justice and social um, inclusivity.
so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there for now and then maybe in the Q&A I can talk about the more recent developments uh, and, and what's changed since I think January or December when I was writing this. Great, thank you so much, Andre. Um, I'll hand things over to Sarah now before we open up for discussion. Okay, hi. Um, I want to thank everyone at NACLA and the wonderful editors of this issue. I think this is a very important conversation, so I'm very happy um, and honored to be a part of it. I'm gonna say a couple things first about the article and then spend a, if, if you guys want me to, I can spend a couple minutes um, talking about Cuba's response to the pandemic and what the payoff has been for them, if, if any. Um, so when NACLA approached Julio Cesar Guanche and I with the idea of writing a piece, thinking about what a progressive US foreign policy on Cuba to Cuba would look like, the very first thing that I thought was, we already know what a progressive foreign policy to Cuba would look like. We've been talking about it for 60 years and the embargo, and the embargo, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but this was really welcome because it, I thought of it as a chance to go beyond that um, and sort of, you know, see where we can position ourselves in relation to continuing that conversation beyond ending the embargo. Uh, so in 2014, when the rapprochement between Cuba and the US began, uh, I think it was very welcome by most Cubans, by Democrats in the US, uh, by progressives. Um, together, the governments took some very positive and necessary steps that really began to help Cuba out and break with 55 years of strangled relations. But as much as we welcomed the opening, an issue that I and I think many other people, uh, I suppose, had uh, found concerning about Obama's rhetoric was that as much as it was respectful of the Cuban government, in the US, his policies were presented as an alternative way to achieve the same goals as before. So in other words, Obama's policies by other means were still framed as regime change policy. So we could not dislodge the Cuban government by suffocating it. Uh, let's try something else. So, but the premise was the same, that Cuba's government has no right to exist, that it needed to be transformed and that the US could still play a role in that. So uh, in writing the article and drafting the article, we were thinking about, you know, what thinking about what we would like to see from progressive politicians, I think the first thing is to have them abandon this idea that the US should be pursuing regime change. One of the arguments throughout the Cold War in the United States and against Cuba was that Cuba's system was illegitimate because it was imported from Russia and the Soviet Union, it was the Red Scare. The idea that Cuba's form of government is, is illegitimate is still with us and is still the premise and the rationale for covert US operations, even in recent years, and for its economic sanctions. So the first part of our article uh, makes an effort to, you know, briefly but trace some of Cuba's leftist socialist thought, starting from the late 19th century to before the 1959 revolution in order to show that socialist ideas in Cuba, uh, small letter, lower capital socialist, this, this is not a huge, it's not a category that's just, okay. So in order to show that these socialist ideas in Cuba have a long history and that socialist ideals and egalitarian ideals permeated popular politics on several levels, way before Fidel Castro came around. Um, so we provide that little bit in order to, to, to say, you know, this, their government isn't illegitimate. It's not, all, it's not imported from Russia. There's, there's a lot more going on here. There's a long history of this. Um, I think among other things that we would want progressive politicians to know and take into account is that even today, 60 years later, there's a lot of support for Cuban socialism in Cuba. I'm not in the business of speaking for Cubans, but I do think that many, many of them just want to see their system improved. They want to see a socialism that works well for them and for everyone on the island. Uh, They're not begging for capitalism. Some people might be, but not everyone. Most, I don't know if, if most, most might be a, 
too categorical of a, of a claim, but many, many Cubans are not interested at all in that. So a second section of the article um, talks a bit more about how US interventionist policy has backfired and, and actually stopped and undermined a necessary change from happening. Um, recent USAID programs have actually undermined real processes of social critique happening within Cuba. Um, I know that we're running sort of short on time, so I'll, I'll, I'll pivot now. Um, we, the third section, we, we wrote this piece back in December and January uh, when the pandemic was not yet on the horizon. And it really does feel like years, years have passed since then. Um, but in this third section, which was uh, about Cuba's own foreign policy to the world and its internationalism, uh, there was a, a couple sentences, a couple parts that sort of have aged really well <laughs> in the last month or two. Um, as part of its attempt to challenge U.S. conceptions of development, uh, one of the hallmark hallmarks of Cuba's internationalism has been its medical brigades. Uh, Cuba has been sending doctors abroad since 1963. Uh, when they started out with 55 doctors to Algeria, sent to Algeria to replace the French doctors who were fleeing after Algeria's independence. Uh, cut to 2018 and Cuba had 50,000 doctors working in about 67 countries, uh, many throughout Latin America and other parts of the world. Uh, this is Cuba's largest and most important export, earning them about $60 billion a year. The, the program, the, the medical brigades, function both as an important source of income for the government um, and its doctors, and as a way to finance its free medical education across the island. And it provides important political capital to Cuba, which is able to cast itself in a positive light for its efforts to help people around the world. So a month and a half ago, I don't, I can't tell time anymore. Um, <laughs> Even with the pandemic showing signs that it could create a crisis in Cuba, uh, the government opted to send medical personnel to Lombardi, Italy, to help with the, the coronavirus crisis. Um, it then received a bunch, of more, a bunch more requests by uh, neighboring countries in the Caribbean and other parts to send medical professionals there. So now Cuba has doctors in 60s, 16 countries uh, fighting the virus. The move was controversial. Uh, it was attacked by Trump very publicly on his tweets. Um, and it was also you know, questioned by a lot of Cubans, both on the island and off, who were like, we don't have the resources for this. Why are you, why are you sending our doctors when we might need them really soon? Um, so, but I think the campaign has actually been a real success. Um, and that Cuba's insistence of taking this on has has paid off, not just in, the, in terms of the lives they, the doctors might have saved in other parts of the world, um, but Cuba has clearly won an important media fight. There are articles across mainstream media touting, you know, maybe not quite the success of, of, of the brigades yet because we don't know what that is looking like in reality, but, uh, but the message has been positive. So they've won an important fight. Um, and they have successfully provided a tangible example of the kind of foreign policy that will help us get us out of this mess. Uh, I think people who are readers of NACLA will, will, will agree that it's not by hold, containing ourselves within our borders that we're going to end this. Um, I saw someone comment recently that the fact that a poor, this is exactly sort of the point, uh, the fact that a poor country can provide free medical care to people, um, and I would add in their country and outside of their country, really undermines the arguments made by people in the U.S. who oppose Medicare for all. So uh, the other huge success of this has been the counterpoint that it has provided uh, for everyone in the world who are looking at literally opposed systems Cuba's socialism, communism, and U.S. capitalism, and the stark contrast between their responses to this virus. Um, but, you know, even beyond the material medical help, uh, I think in like 
I mean, on a, just a, even a, just a symbolic level uh, in such a confusing and like dark times. The Cuban example, I think, has provided a really much needed symbolic source of light for those of us trying to believe that a better world is possible. Um, they've been doing this since 1963, but, but right now it, it's, it seems to have really paid off <laughs> um, for those of us searching for something to grasp onto um, in terms of positivity. So um, I can talk a little bit about what's happening on the island if anybody wants, um, or I can do that afterwards. Yes, okay. So uh, because one of the question was how, questions was, how is Cuba going to send doctors abroad when they're going to have a practical system collapse, practically a system collapse in a few weeks? Um, and uh, many of us looking at Cuba were like, oh my God, they haven't quarantined, they haven't quarantined, this is gonna be a disaster. Um, and actually, they seem to have known what they were doing. <laughs> So Cuba has a very high medical professional to people ratio with about 95,000 doctors and about 85,000 nurses for a population of 11 million. Uh, so really like sending a small percentage of that people um, abroad doesn't really affect with their ability to cope with the pandemic on the island. Um, we were all worried about how cat catastrophic the situation could be there, but they seem to have things under control. They've done widespread testing. They're making their medical students uh, doing visits, uh, at home visits to everybody, really, to about 9 million people of the 11 million on the island, um, just to make sure that they're doing well, that they don't show signs of, of contagion or whatever. Um, and they've now had about 1,440 known infections with 58 people who have passed away. There's about 800 people hospitalized and the rest are at home. Um, I think they're adhere they seem to be adhering more or less well to the quarantine, um, but with their lack of resources, it is still a, a worry, I think. Um, and yet the internationalist campaign has, has succeeded. Um, I think that's it. I think we can move on to questions. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, Alejandro, I don't know how you want to move forward because I know we're short on time. I'm happy to start off the questions with maybe one and then move to the, the rest of the participants or we can go straight to the participants. I don't know what you'd prefer. Um, yeah, why don't we um, just for, for um, out of respect to the folks who've been tuning in, why don't we maybe do some questions and then maybe you sure. can jump in. That Sounds work? great. Yes. Um, so I have a question here from someone for Linda um, asking if you could speak about how independent um, coordination with the Añez government and the Supreme Electoral Tribunal, um, what, how independent uh, sorry, I'm trying to see exactly what it is they're asking. Um, and I think they're asking what uh, the extent to which um, the Anya's government or the Supreme Electoral Tribunal um, it will be acting independently and in determining whether the elections will be held or not, or who exactly will be making this decision. Right. Okay, thanks. Um, so the issue about the Electoral Commission or the tribunal in Bolivia has been uh, an issue for some time uh, in terms of uh, issues around its independence. And there was definitely an issue during under the Morales government. And that was one of the main criticisms um, of the government, of the Morales government, was that they controlled who was on the <clears throat> Electoral Tribunal. The 2009 constitution in Bolivia uh, uh, basically a lot, uh, provided that the, the, the people on the tribunal would be selected by Congress. And since Bolivia had never before the MAS, really since I think um, maybe ever, <laughs> or at least since the 1950s, had one party dominate uh, the Congress, the issue of just having representatives from one party on the Electoral Commission had never really come up because there had always been opposition that had successfully got 
uh, some representation from different political parties. Of course, that didn't happen under the Moss. The Moss controlled Congress. They controlled both the upper and lower house of the Congress. And so they were able to put their own people, as is logical in a, in a political system, put their own people into the tribunal. Of course, this immediately, <clears throat> and they were following the law, but this immediately provoked a great deal of criticism that the tribunal was stacked in their favor. So when, and, and that was particularly became the case when the tribunal allowed Abel Morales to run for what was effectively a fourth term. It was, a, he, the tribunal was accused of doing so under pressure from the mass. So when Abel left, a new tribunal was selected and actually, fortunately, I believe, um, the person who was chosen to head it uh, was someone who had been on the tribunal, the electoral tribunal, the last time that Bolivia had a transition government, which was in 2005, when Carlos Mesa had been forced out by popular demonstrations. So um, he is, it's fair to say, seen as pretty professional and fair and not likely to simply do the bidding of the government. But the issue about who gets to actually make the final decision about when these elections will be, which is a critical issue, um, as the current government consolidates more and more power, um, you know, the longer they're in power, and, and also has not behaved like an interim government since the beginning, I mean, in, in, in a whole variety of ways. It actually is the Congress that makes a decision about when that passes the law that allows or determines when the date of the election will be. And the Congress is still dominated by the mass. So it will be interesting to see how that, how that actually plays out. The mass is pushing for elections to happen at the end of July. Um, this I see as really problematic because given the current situation with coronavirus, it's unlikely, I think, that any of us are going to be able to travel at the end of July. So this means that international delegations to monitor the elections will not be able to um, to, to be there. And I, I was, I, I mean, I have plans, I have a, a delegation organized and basically ready to go uh, to from progressive lawyers in the U.S. to go and monitor the next elections. But, you know, there's no indication that by the end of July, anybody will be able to get into the country safely or feel safe being in the country. So I think that's it. Great, thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, <clears throat> so there's a question now for Alex. So this question relates to the data that you've collected about how sanctions are effectively causing immense amounts of suffering and death. And in addition to that, they actually haven't led in many instances to the regime change that they're intended um, to bring about. So, or the demands for regime change. So then this person is asking, why not then oppose the use of sanctions as a violation of human rights? We may have to dial back, but why not start with what we really want and, and advocate for that with progressive co Congress people? Um, and they note that the argument that it doesn't seem to work um, seems like a sensible one, meaning that sanctions aren't even having their intended effects and moreover, they're causing a lot of suffering. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I agree with that completely. Um, so I, I just mentioned as an example of one of the things that can be supported this um, legislation that's been introduced by Ilian Omar. Um, I think there are some additional points about that legislation that are worth sharing, especially in light of this question. Um, it, it actually does look at, at the human rights issue and in particular um, the international legality of sanctions. And so one of the things it does uh, is that it requires um, a report uh, from the State Department, probably not the ideal source, uh, but that's unfortunately how it often works, but a report in any case where they have to show whether the sanctions, broad economic sanctions, uh, whether they um, are in violation of uh, treaty um, requirements that, you know, treaties that the U.S. is 
has signed. And, and many legal experts argue that they're not. Uh, and, you know, there's no real way around that, uh, including the UN Charter. Um, in general, I think there's a lot of consensus within the community of experts on international law that coercive economic measures are illegal. Um, and, you know, there's, you know, there, there are various conventions and so on that you can point to uh, that can reinforce that argument. Um, and so I think that's one other positive thing of the Omar legislation. And it also requires, um, I think it might be the, the GAO, the General Accounting Office, to look at um, to look at the impact of sanctions on the economy of countries. Um, and, and here again, uh, if they do this in a credible way, uh, I think they're going to have to show uh, that, you know, it's having a terrible impact on um, ordinary people in these countries. I, I don't think you can really get around that. So I think that's useful reporting language to have in there. Um, but, you know, if it were for me, I would certainly be pushing for an all right uh, prohibition of broad economic sanctions. They're totally barbaric. Um, I think there's, you know, it should be obvious uh, to people. And, you know, I think if people were a little bit better informed on what uh, effects sanctions are having, um, you know, in Venezuela and Iran and in, in Cuba, uh, I mean, it's drastically reduced the national incomes of those countries, and as a result, has um, led to you know higher levels of poverty, tougher you know living conditions, um, and uh, a decline in in certain basic services. And of course, Cuba has managed to to maintain a lot of social services despite that, you know, to their credit, but it's extremely tough. Um, so I think there are a few members of Congress that agree with that. Um, and, you know, they've put out letters and statements. We've been involved with some of that work. Um, but in terms of legislation that might actually get some traction, I think the, the Omar legislation is, is certainly one vehicle. Um, and hopefully there can be others. Um, I'll just mention as, as the sort of opportunity of this moment, of this COVID-19 moment, uh, there's the fact that you have for the first time now a lot of mainstream media actually reporting on the effects that these sanctions are having on the, the debilitated response of uh, governments uh, to COVID-19, to the pandemic. Um, you're seeing a lot, a lot of reporting now where, where sanctions are being mentioned. And you're having more sort of global leaders that are talking about the impact of sanctions as well. You've had um, the Secretary General um, and also the UN Human Rights Commissioner, Michelle Bachelet, uh, that have both called for um, a lifting or easing of sanctions uh, right now. Um, and, and this is an appeal that we're seeing from a lot of governments. Um, and sort of a lot of editorial writers and so on. So that there's a moment right now where people are conscious of, wait a minute. And I think it's because, uh, you know, unfortunately from the perspective of certainly some of these people, particularly the sort of the financial press, they're aware that, um, you know, the global economy is going to go to hell if we don't get rid of the pandemic all over the world. And right now sanctions are are basically, you know, making it harder to do that. Uh, so I think, you know, they come from it, you know, they come to it from that perspective, which isn't really our perspective, but it's uh, something that I think, you know, is useful to use right now. And, and it's forced them to acknowledge the impact of sanctions. Um, so I, I think there can be more momentum uh, around sanctions work right now. And there, there is stuff going on. I can point people to a, a, a new web page that's gone up with a letter, an organizational sign-on, um, and that we'll have more actions around uh, how to oppose economic sanctions and you know, to try to get uh, members of Congress more engaged on that subject. And I think it's called, um, what the hell is it called? Uh, okay, it's sanctions. Um, Hold on. Um, lift sanctions, save lives. Sorry, I had a blank. Uh, 
lift sanctions save lives. Um, and I think you can Google that and, and find that web page. And I think that could be of interest to people who want to do more around uh, the sanctions issue right now. Thanks. So I think we have a, a, a set of questions. Maybe we can group them together. Um, is that okay, Vanessa? Yeah, sure. Great. So there's a couple on, on Cuba. Um, and so one has to do, I think, uh, it's more a comment, but I think that, that you can phrase it as a question, which is, how is the pandemic um, affecting disproportionately Cuba in, in terms of, of race, right? I mean, as we know, Cuba is highly stratified racially. And so, yeah, are you seeing any, um, how are you seeing sort of race, racism play out in terms of the internal responses to um, the pandemic in Cuba? Um, and that's in light, that's also tied to a question about, uh, well, why hasn't Cuba been quarantining, which I think you mentioned in the beginning, there wasn't much quarantining going on. So what, you know, what, why was that a sort of a medical response? Um, uh, was it in terms of, of scarcity related to sanctions, et cetera? So that's, you know, it's a related question. Um, I think for Andre, it's not specifically about Brazil, but it speaks to the question about env the environment um, and how it should figure into a, into a response. Um, it's, it has to do with, do you see in light of COVID-19 that environmental policies in Latin America or perhaps specifically in Brazil might be weakened or fortified? Right. As you know, I suspect that, you know, as, as nations try to then, you know, restart their economies, will that, you know, see a spike in carbon use or, you know, carbon economies rather than a, um, you know, retreat. So, so there's that issue. Um, yeah, I think for, for Linda, there's a question here on, um, do you know if local NGOs are providing or playing a role in providing assistance and relief to the Chapada region and or other um, uh, vulnerable areas? Um, and if so, you know, how is that response playing out? And then um, we'll finish this round and then we can take another round. Um, I guess it's a little bit more for, for Alex in light of, of specifically, um, you know, U.S. policy in terms of economics and statecraft. Um, one, do you sense that a Biden administration would stop supporting Juan Guaido, um, you know, Venezuela, or would it just be a slightly less aggressive stance towards Maduro? So how does that play out? And then um, with Almagro being reelected as head of the OAS and when us would effectively, you know, now defunct, it seems like there's no spaces left in the hemisphere to promote regional integration or for, for anti-imperialist or counter-hegemonic discussion. Um, is, is your sense that CELAC could fill that role, but it doesn't seem up to the task for now, or do you think that new spaces will emerge? So Sarah, do you wanna start? Yeah, sure. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? It's, I have the gardeners right outside my window, uh, blowing leaves and so it got really loud all of a sudden. Um, so to the question on Cuba quarantining, they are now, uh, just to be clear, but at the beginning, so we are a few weeks ahead of them in the process. And uh, so as we were watching the situation escalate, uh, we were thinking there are going to be asymptomatic people spreading this across the island, um, community spread, and they're not doing anything about it. And what, uh, what they were doing in Cuba is finding a case, contacting everybody around them and quarantining those people. Uh, but, but a lot of people, even in Cuba, didn't think that that was enough. So uh, with a lot of pressure, and I think the Cuban government, they didn't quarantine initially because uh, they were confident that they could uh, sort of keep the infection rates low. Uh, when the rates started rising, they did sort of issue quarantines in entire neighborhoods and then uh, in places mostly where, where they're mostly affected. Uh, to the question on racial disparities, there is absolutely, there's no doubt that there's, there's inequality, uh, racial disparities uh, in Cuba and that the people who, the people of color, black Cubans are going to be the most affected by this. To add to that, there's a drought in Cuba right now. Um, and as the person pointed out, there's 
there's no access to water. How are you supposed to even wash your hands? Um, or, you know, where do you get water to drink? So, so it, it is pro absolutely problematic. Um, you know, that being said, they've, they've been doing a lot to keep the rates low and it seems to be working. I don't know what the racial breakdown of deaths is. Um, I don't know if it's as we've seen here where obviously people of color are the ones uh, most affected or, or dying. Um, uh, so I, I think that was it. Who's next? Uh, Nick? Sorry, I forgot to unmute. Um, so the question about the, the Amazon environmental policy, um, one of the things I talk about in the paper is that Brazil has a, a robust set of, of environmental laws that are, when enforced, really quite good at, at, at measuring deforestation, at preventing deforestation. But of course, those laws are only as good as the enforcement mechanisms. And one of the things that the Bolsonaro administration has done is for, uh, for, first of all, signal that it, you know, it finds those, um, that legislation burdensome, overburden, overly burdensome to uh, economic activity. And so if your rhetoric as a candidate and as a president is that you think the, the legislation goes too far, um, that, you know, might tell you if you're a large landowner or if you're involved in, uh, in illegal mining, illegal f uh, foresting, that, you know, maybe the government won't uh, be enforcing as as hard and, sh and, and uh, as intensely. And sure enough, that's been the case. So we've seen this this high uh, increase. Now, part of the question regarding COVID nineteen is to the extent that the government is uh, enforcing uh, this legislation, to the extent that economic activity is continuing in the Amazon, how are people who live in these places? Um, being exposed or, or, or responding to, to the, the disease. So there's, there's been all kinds of almost a, um, you know, nightmare scenarios thrown out there of, uh, of mass contagion among indigenous people uh, mm -hmm. dying at, 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 at really high rates. We have not seen that yet, uh, but there's a concern that, you know, as things begin to be uh, brought under control, that is the rate of infection, economic activity would resume and these people who live in these areas uh, would then be exposed more than they are being now. And that would lead to a new wave of, of death and, and, and devastation among these communities. So this is on the radar of international observers. The government itself has said that it will not allow that to happen, right? That it, it's, it's going to be very careful about, um, you know, monitoring deforestation, but also even if that's happening to be careful with local populations to prevent the kind of, uh, exposure to, to, to this disease. You know, I don't have a lot of faith that the government will be able to, or will, 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 will be able to expend resources to prevent that from happening, but it's really something I think to watch now and going forward. To the extent that economic activity returns to these areas, how does that affect people who live there? It's, you know, very much an open question. If I make just a thought on the question about Biden and, and Guaido and, and that dynamic, you know, I, I was speaking recently to a few people who advised the Sanders campaign about foreign policy. And one of the things they talked about was how even the campaign was largely surprised by the backlash it received when Bernie, you know, even new, with nuance and I think with a degree of subtlety, tried to talk about Cuba and how they were, the campaign was completely overwhelmed in the media and by other candidates, you know, sort of how dare you even question the totalitarian nature of the regime and you know there's there can be no room for subtlety so if i had to imagine it i don't know for sure but if i had to imagine the, the the biden campaign in terms of foreign policy and specifically foreign policy toward latin america will be very cautious about deviating from what has become the consensus view among so many in washington which is that guaido is you know the guy i mean that seems to be maybe fading a little bit but i don't imagine a new bold progressive stance from from the Biden administration, again in part because I think of the backlash that uh, the Bernie campaign experienced specifically. Mm. A lot of reporting on this in the state of Florida. So, you know, I, I I'm not really hopeful that we'll see much movement. Uh, so 
should I also maybe react to that question? Yeah, just to jump in there and, and Linda will take the, the, the question on NGOs in Bolivia. Okay. Um, yeah, so on, on Guaido, uh, I think, you know, first of all, um, we need to be conscious of the fact that Guaido um, exists because of Trump. And I don't think a democratic administration or even a slightly different Republican administration would have supported um, uh, Guaido the way that uh, uh, Trump has. Um, and it all has to do with Florida politics. And it um, has essentially to do with uh, Trump's very close relationship with uh, Marco Rubio. Um, he didn't have a close relationship originally, but um, you know, obviously they were rivals during the presidential campaign in 2016. Uh, but they, they sort of formed a pact, uh, it's pretty clear, um, in, in sort of the spring of 2017 around there, uh, where it became very clear that, that Rubio was going to do everything he could to help Trump in Florida. And uh, in exchange, uh, Trump sort of did his bidding uh, on Latin America. I'm simplifying. There are other actors that played a big role, John Bolton, for instance, and others. But I think that the relationship with Rubio was key, and particularly as Rubio uh, is someone that has had uh, very close ties to the more, I would say, radical opposition in Venezuela, um, the sort of Leopoldo Lopez, Maria Carina Machado, um, more extreme wing of the opposition that, you know, you could say is less democratic, that has sort of pushed for change uh, through extra constitutional means and so on historically, going back a long time. Um, and, uh, you know, essentially, uh, Guaido was not someone, I mean, his party was, um, you know, not a major party in the opposition. Uh, Voluntad Popular um, was sort of the fifth most important party. So it was, uh, it was down there. Um, and, you know, he got support because, uh, I, I mean, essentially he was very close to Leopoldo Lopez. Uh, and Leopoldo Lopez had this relationship um, with Marco Rubio and a few of the hardliners in, in Florida. Um, and I, th I think Leopoldo Lopez and um, Guaido would have remained very isolated within Venezuela had it not been for um, the fact that there was this pact and the fact that um, uh, Trump slash Rubio, um, you know, came up with this plan to recognize Guaido as president in, in early January. Um, and, and then there was a whole sequencing involved where they'd been lobbying uh, right-wing governments in Latin America beforehand and so on and, and got immediate recognition from Bolsonaro, from Duque in Colombia and others. Um, I don't think that would have happened. I don't think that scenario would have played out um, you know, under a Biden uh, administration if there'd been one back then or a, a Hillary administration. Um, I, I think they would have been closer to perhaps some more moderate um, actors within the opposition. And, and I believe that's the case actually with Biden today. From what I understand, um, you know, the, the, the folks in there that have some influence on Latin America policy are actually um, closer to the more moderate elements within uh, the Venezuelan opposition. Um, now, how that'll play out if there is a Biden presidency is a big question because you know, once, um, you know, the U.S. has gone ahead and supported Guaido and so on, it's, it's hard to unlock those policies. And um, particularly, you know, when um, Florida politics is such a huge concern for both parties. Um, and, you know, I think what's been stunning is that one of the biggest supporters of Juan Guaido in Washington has been uh, you know, Nancy Pelosi and some of the Democratic leadership. And that has to do again with Florida politics. Um, so my sense is that uh, there are people uh, in the Biden campaign, uh, you know, that have an influence that are not particularly progressive, but I would say are sort of more rational um, and can see that the more extremist wing of the Venezuelan opposition uh, is not, you know, the sort of best player to, to resolve the crisis within the country and would like to involve the moderates more. 
you know, whether they're going to be able to do that um, is a question that has more to do with domestic politics, unfortunately, than with uh, foreign policy. So I, I'm, I'm not sure what can happen, but I, there, I think there is a possibility of change. Um, you know, one, one can hope. Okay, um, I'm going to respond to the question uh, about NGOs in Bolivia. Um, I, I'm not really aware of uh, NGOs being really involved in um, food pantry kind of work or, or feeding the hungry kind of work. Um, the NGO sector in Bolivia, once Bolivia was proclaimed a middle income country, by the World Bank, uh, funding to NGOs, uh, international funding to NGOs cut off drastically. And that started happening really at the beginning of Evo Morales' government. And so there is really a very limited amount of direct service now NGOs um, in Bolivia. And that, that figure, I mean, NGOs really replaced government because government really uh, during the neoliberal period pretty much disappeared, uh, especially in rural areas where they had never really had uh, almost any presence whatsoever um, until 1994. Um, so NGOs had a really important role during that period of time, but in under the, the Morales government, not so much. And of course, a lot of people in the opposition and people in NGOs, even progressive people in NGOs, blame the Evo Morales government as um, the reason why they don't have international funding, whether when in fact it was a trend that was um, happening before, even though Evo did, uh, Evo, the Evo Morales government did on occasion uh, have, go loggerheads with several NGOs in the country. The other thing I wanted to mention that n nobody has mentioned um, yet, and I, I just realized it because somebody just sent me an email about it, but it, it, today is actually the 55th anniversary of the U.S. invasion of the Dominican Republic in 1965, which was um, an influential part of the founding of NACO. So I just wanted to put that on the agenda or on the table as something we should recognize. Great, thank you. I have two more questions I can um, hand over to participants. Um, well, actually we have, I have three. So um, the first two are related to COVID-19. Um, one specifically for Sarah about the use of Cuban pharmaceuticals in fighting the virus. So the question of um, who's using Cuba and Cuban developed drugs for combating the virus and as a secondary part of that question, is there a way to be able to promote the use of Latin American or Caribbean produced drugs? Um, well, I guess in this case, specifically in Cuba for the virus in light of the disinformation that's happening um, or being kind of actively promoted by US leaders, of course, most prominently Donald Trump. Uh, the second COVID related question, I think, um, could go to a number of the panelists. Um, and the question is, is, is what we're seeing with the COVID crisis now essentially what Naomi Klein has referred to as this shock doctrine situation in which states and um, particularly neoliberal or right-wing states are using a crisis um, to their own benefit. So there are myriad examples we could give, but marginalizing certain uh, groups, uh, you know, privileging particular, the preservation or the protection of particular lives over others, um, the rolling back of civil liberties and human rights, um, heightened border militarization and deportations, and then, you know, the cases that we're seeing um, where there's a restriction of the left participating in elections, um, not just in maybe Bolivia, but also in the United States and Brazil. Um, so this broad question about what are the possible long-term consequences and if there's a way of fighting back. Mm. Um, the third question is, is more specific. Perhaps, Linda, this would be something you could answer, which is a question about um, Peru's response to COVID-19. Um, and specifically, this person notes that Peru has had the largest number of cases reported in Latin America, but has also taken maybe some of the more dramatic measures against it. So placing a strict quarantine, um, passing a robust stimulus plan, 
So I don't know if you or any of the other panelists, if you have um, and a good hold on um, the Peru's response and maybe why there's an Im a apparent imbalance between uh, aggressive response and a high number of cases. Um, can I just jump in quickly to say that um, one of the things that we've been doing on the web, our, our, um, our web portal, NACLA.org, is uh, publishing stories about regional and very specific, um, you know, sub-regional responses to COVID. Um, we've had one on Colombia, we have one in Argentina, um, and we will have one over the next week or two on Peru in particular from, uh, uh, from Alejandra um, Vigano there. So, um, so please stay tuned for, for that, but certainly if, if anyone has information about what's going on now, that would be, that would be great. And finally, just uh, Alex wanted to remind you of the question about, um, uh, about the OAS and new fora or any kind of fora for, um, you know, a different kind of vision um, in light of uh, Almagro's re-election. Uh, should I start? Yeah, yeah go ahead, Sarah. Um, so to the question on the Cuban pharmaceuticals, um, early on in the pandemic, um, the Cubans mentioned that they had some um, a drug that they saw was successful in fighting um, the advance of coronavirus in patients. Um, that drug, inter Interferon 2B, um, was quickly touted in the media, perhaps a little bit hyperbolically, as a potentially life-saving drug. Um, it's not that it, it's not, it's just that we didn't really have yet the evidence. There, because coronavirus is so new, we don't really have scientific um, evidence showing that this was, and the Cubans themselves later you know, said that as well. Uh, but it really sort of went around in the media as, um, as this huge thing. Um, I think we need to wait to see the scientific studies. And if we find out that interfer interferon 2B is actually, is re it really is a life-saving drug, then we need to really ask the question about what to do about it. Because yes, it's produced in China, um, but it's it's partially Cuban as well. So would the United States be open to importing that drug into the U.S.? How to do that and how to convince um, the government <laughs> to accept it, or you know if they have any humanity. But I don't think that we're there yet because there seem to be many drugs that, that are being used to uh, lower the sort of effect of the infection on, on people who are in, in grave crisis. So I think we're still waiting on that, the sort of the real evidence on that. Um, there was another question. There was something about, I wanted to say something about Peru to echo um, the question on Peru. They have had an amazing response. Um, they were really quick, really efficient. And I've been wondering the same thing. What happened? Why did their rates skyrocket all of a sudden? Um, is it because of the large amount of informal workers in Peru that perhaps are not protected? So, you know, I think that is a really interesting question because Argentina had a really amazing response as well, really quick, and they've, and they, and they've succeeded. Um, but Peru did really the same. Their package was, I think, larger than, their aid package was larger than Argentina's um, and targets specifically more poor people. So, yeah, what happened there? I would, thought I would address the question about shock doctrine and, and, and things like that. Um, a week ago, yesterday, I was actually surprised by how sort of, um, how openly the man in the Brazilian finance ministry who's tasked with overseeing uh, the funds to, uh, for, the, for the COVID response, ruling out categorically um, new taxes on the high, highest income earners and, and, and a well, sort of uh, any kind of idea of a wealth tax categorically ruling that out and saying the way the government intends to make up for the spending uh, that, it, that it's doing right now is by fast tracking privatizations and that they would be requesting, um, they would be requesting, I'm blanking on the term, it was an, it's an English term, but they would, oh, fast track. They'd be requesting fast track authority from Congress to basically sell off state assets to make up for it. And, you know, he argued in, in, in this interview with, with Folia, the, the largest newspaper, 
that this would be doubly beneficial, right? One, it would help defray the cost now of, of the social expenditures, but it would also make everything else run more smoothly by you know, reducing the size of the state, reducing the bureaucracy. So he argued that it would actually be you know, doubly effective. And I was just taken aback by how sort of openly that's embracing the, the whole idea of using the crisis to fundamentally kind of reshape um, these large parts of, of, of the federal um, government. Now, I would imagine that's going to be a source of some political dispute uh, in Brazil, not least because uh, the Bolsonaro administration has really set itself apart from many state governors um, in terms of how they're responding to this, right? It's, you know, large states, Rio de Janeiro, uh, uh, Sao Paulo, uh, are led by people who up until very recently were allies of Bolsonaro, but who have refused to kind of go along with his feet dragging, I think. Bolsonaro has gone back and forth and really, you know, looks, and every time he talks about this issue, like he's having his teeth pulled when he tells people to stay home. He really does not want to have to be the guy saying, you know, stay home, stop everything. He's saying, right, the country cannot stop. Um, and you've had these state governors, also conservatives, also, you know, center right, right wing say, that's crazy, right? Stay home. We'll deal with the ramifications later. So I imagine that, um, there will be some dispute, obviously from the left, center left, but even I would imagine some figures on the center and center right to say that like, this is not the time, this is not the moment to use state uh, uh, enterprises, state assets to defray the cost, to make up for the cost of social investment. And there are, there's even some movement in the opposite direction. Um, Eduardo Suplicy, who's a longtime member of the, of the Workers' Party, uh, who has been pushing a UBI, a universal basic income for decades at this point, said the other day that he's confident and he, you know, he's, he's, he's old, he, he older, he's on the older end of the uh, generational spectrum. He's I think in his early eighties maybe. And he was saying he feels confident he will live to see a universal basic, basic income in Brazil in part because of the disruption that's happening now, right? The government uh, again, pulling teeth from the federal government, but 600 reais uh, for workers, informal workers a month through, through all of this. Um, which he hopes and he says he believes is laying the groundwork for a more per permanent um, universal basic, basic income. So I think we're really at a moment in Brazil where it could go one of two ways, right? Deepening some of the progressive uh, uh, policy wish list that, uh, that, that many in the Workers' Party and the left have been fighting for for years, or using it to fast track this, this new kind of neoliberal agenda of privatizations and others. So again, something to watch going forward. Um, yeah, the question to me, uh, oh, the shock doctrine. Um, yeah, I mean, you can clearly see in Bolivia as it's almost always so frequently dramatic cases of um, trends that are going on elsewhere. The use of um, this crisis to consolidate power by the extreme right wing who were not in any way, shape or form elected and uh, to increase the use, and I think this is an issue throughout Latin America, increase the use of the military, um, raise the military profile in all countries, and also paint the military and, and, and in very favorable terms as people who keep order and, and make you safe. And I think that that's really very dangerous territory um, to be going in, in anywhere in Latin America. And that, that is certainly happening in Bolivia. And that is certainly of a great concern. In terms of Peru, um, yes, I mean, Peru has the second largest number of COVID-19 cases after Brazil, which is quite astonishing because its population is much smaller. Um, and the response was very strict and very dramatic. I think that it is the classic situation, although it is not nearly as poor as Bolivia, um, it's a classic situation of a lot of, of impoverished people who cannot socially distance uh, because they won't eat if they don't. Um, Peru also has a million Venezuelan refugees. Um, so that is another very vulnerable population within, within Peru, sorry, within Peru at this point. Alex, did you want to take the OAS one? Uh, yeah, and I guess I'll be quick since it looks like we have about five minutes. But um, I mean, we are in a very bad place right now. Latin America is in a bad place geopolitically. I'm sure everybody's aware of that. And 
you know, unfortunately, these integration efforts have always been a reflection of the geopolitical approach of the region. And so, obviously, over the last few years, uh, the pink tide has uh, been mostly swept away, uh, you know, sometimes democratically, sometimes not democratically at all, um, as in the case in Honduras and in Brazil, for instance. Uh, but, you know, basically, we're now in a situation where uh, those that really want to have um, a sort of a common regional uh, program uh, that doesn't involve the U.S. are a very small, small minority. Um, and, and basically, they consist of uh, today, Argentina, and to a certain extent, Mexico. Mexico is so dependent on the U.S., um, unfortunately, economically and so on, that it, it makes it very difficult for it to, to sort of participate in, in regional integration. In fact, it's always been the outlier historically, although perhaps it would be a little so under the current government. Um, and, and of course, uh, there's really no hope at the U.S. at the moment, where Almagro has just been reelected. And uh, he got reelected in part because he had such massive support from the Trump administration that went and lobbied uh, for his reelection in the Caribbean, split the Caribbean countries, just made sure that he would win in the first. Well, it looks like we lost Alex. Uh, well, maybe he'll rejoin. Sorry about that, Hello. folks. Hello. Alex? Sorry, I got knocked off for some reason. Uh, did you lose me a while ago? No, no, no. At the, uh, so the U.S. Uh, lobbied hard. They split the Caribbean. Yes. So, and, and, and that was, of course, thanks to the fact that Almagro really did the bidding of Trump slash Rubio. Um, and particularly, you know, in the final months of, of his first term, uh, when, of course, he supported the coup in, in Bolivia um, very, very actively. And, and the OAS, uh, of course, played a rather sinister role um, in those elections. And that's something that Seepers looked at a, a lot. Uh, they made uh, false claims um, uh, the day after the elections uh, regarding the quick count that had taken place. Um, and those false claims after, afterwards were kind of the basis for a fraud narrative uh, in the country. And so that's something that, that we looked at a lot and I invite you to have a look at our Bolivia page uh, at seeper.net. But it's, it's, a, it's another example of, you know, the sort of um, nefarious role that the OAS has been playing in the region. I'd, I'd say there's a long history of that, but um, you know, I would say it was very bad in the 60s and 70s. Um, and, and now it's just about as bad again, if not, not as bad as during the period where, um, you know, much of Latin America, certainly South America was dominated by military dictatorships. Um, so um, I don't hold hope in the OAS uh, getting better anytime soon. But um, I think, you know, where I'm slightly optimistic is, uh, you know, going back to the U.S. the U.S. continually plants the seeds of change uh, of, let's say, uh, to these policies and to uh, sort of mass movements in favor of change. And I think that's uh, where hope lies. The geopolitics of the region have to change if we're going to see um, the sort of, you know, integration movement that we, with UNISTOR and CELAC and, and, and ALBA and all the rest that were based on being independent from the U.S. and from, you know, um, you know, you know, sort of the more powerful countries in general and, you know, based in South Korea rather than competition. I don't know exactly what it means that Precisely at the moment when you were describing the hopefulness, you were started to kind of fade in and out. I feel like that's sort of uh, thematic um, to this moment of uncertainty that I think we've been describing. But um, I was really struck by Andres' response uh, um, before, right? That, that it is, I think what COVID is illustrating is a fork in the road. 
Um, and even though, as we talked about before, the issue was really in a moment of ebullience and excitement, um, COVID to some extent has, has torn yet again sort of the possibilities about where the future could lie. So um, we don't have time, unfortunately, although I definitely wanted to ask Vanessa, um, and I invite everyone to, to read their, um, the, her introduction with Danny Besner, um, because it situates precisely this tension, right? That, that despite the fact that um, Sanders, who, who it was a catalyst for uh, for thinking through these alternatives is now out. Um, you know, to to a large extent, the energy behind that um, and uh, the 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 ideals that are reflected in some of the pieces and some of what you heard today um, uh, are still very much vibrant and to some extent even more important uh, precisely because of this tremendous fork in the road that, that COVID really presents us um, uh, on the other end. Um, so I, I apologize when I said we didn't have time for that, but I definitely wanted to thank not only you um, and Annie for uh, shepherding this issue through, all of our panelists today for joining us, the rest of the contributors to the issue, um, which I again encourage you to check out on nakla.org, the entire panel of uh, contributors. Um, Heather Geese, our managing editor for putting it together. Leo Schwartz, our web editor for also providing editorial assistance. Um, David uh, Pastor for organizing the webinar. Um, and all of you who tuned in uh, for the opportunity to share some of these ideas and to commune in a moment of physical distancing, but social solidarity, hopefully. So um, thank you all. And we hope to have more of these events in the future. Thanks, Alejandro. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Ciao. Ciao.